Good morning, everybody. These are my uh, disclosures. So all of you are aware that imaging has a big impact on your daily practice. So you know that the presence of metastatic disease defines the lethal phenotype, right? You have metastatic bone disease, you will die from this in general. Okay, so that's the key thing to remember. And the impact of imaging goes beyond that. The imaging defines subgroups in whom you can do your clinical trials. So simply by saying somebody has M plus or M plus plus disease, that defines a clinical group depending on where the patient is in their patient pathway. We also know that imaging, the site of imaging is highly prognostic. And all of you will have seen this paper published last year, looking at the site of metastatic disease and how that influences prognosis. So if you have liver metastases, you are in a bad place. If you have nodal disease, your survival rates are going to be better. And that's defined on imaging, not a PSA test, not on some biomarkers, that's defined on imaging. We also know that the volume of disease, together with patient symptoms, determines what treatment you get. So, if you have castrate-naive prostate cancer, and you have high volume disease, you benefit from combination chemotherapy plus hormonal therapy. The effect is probably less in lower volumes of disease. How do you define volume? on the basis of imaging. So all of you are feeling really good because you're thinking, well, we can do all this stuff, right? You know, why do we need to think creatively? Why do we need to think better? I would say as a radiologist practicing in 2016 that the tools that you are using today are unfit for purpose. <coughs> unfit for purpose. And this is somebody who's actually providing you with these tools and getting paid for it, right? Now, so when I say to you that a patient has no metastatic disease, a lot of these patients have metastatic disease. And that has clinical consequences. If I say a patient has one deposit, I've got my fingers crossed because actually the patient could have two, could have 10, could have 20 that you don't know about. The other problem with imaging is that if you use imaging the way you do it today, you do a disservice to the patient because of your response criteria. And let me just show you a, a, a real world example of this. So here is a patient on enzalutamide. Now, this is the baseline, a PSA of 45. This is not a PET scan, okay? For those of you who think looks like a PET scan, it isn't a PET scan. This is a new whole body MRI scan. And you can see on here that you have retroperitoneal nodal disease, but no bone disease. And therefore, the bone scan is negative. Not surprising. Now, the patient gets treated with enzalutamide, week 13, PSA is suppressed. You can see the nodal disease decreases, no bone disease. Everybody's very happy that this patient is responding. Week 25. Now, what happens? You see there's a deposit just there, sorry, there. And you'll say, what? I can't see that. And then you zoom in. And this is what MRI enables you to do. You've done it twice before. You can zoom in. A red arrow can appear by magic, right? And says, this lesion was not here on the two previous occasions. Therefore, this is oligoprogressive disease at week 25, okay? The problem is, that you guys are using PSA and bone scans. Okay, so what happens? You carry on using quite an expensive treatment, week 27, okay, and week, th so week uh, 37, and then the bone scan becomes positive, one and two lesions. The MRI at this stage is showing five lesions. The problem with your response criteria is that if you see progression, you need to confirm it. So what happens? You keep treating. You keep treating, and at week 49, the patient has 
seven metastases. Now, this was the date of oligoprogressive disease, an opportunity that presented itself. The problem was that you waited till polymetastatic disease appeared. And this is what gets recorded in the notes. So that delay means that you went from less clonal heterogeneity to much more clonal heterogeneity driven by enzalutamide, right? Which we did detect 25 weeks beforehand. Therein lies the problem with your response criteria. A lot of you will say, well, I don't use bone scans. I use PSA and I use CT scans. Well, that, so that's okay, isn't it? It's in the guidelines. Well, look at this patient. This patient develops a flare phenomenon on enzalutamide. And we know that happens, so we can deal with that. And the patient, you can see, over time, improves on enzalutamide. No doubt about the fact that this patient is responding. Look at the CT scan. You see, the CT scan, right, shows the appearance of a new lesion. Lots of radiologists would call that progression because it looks like it's appeared. It's more conspicuous. Therefore, this must be progression. Well, it isn't. This is called sclerotic response. The reason radiologists make this error time and time again is because it looks a bit like this. And this is sclerotic progression. This is a spine that I've straightened out using next generation software. And clearly this patient has progressed. He is more symptomatic, his PSA is going up, you've got lots more disease in the bone marrow. The problem is sclerotic progression and sclerotic response are two features that radiologists really have difficulty in doing. I mean, I know the difference and I have trouble. If I have trouble, other radiologists are also having trouble. And that's what leads to this whole problem. So what can you do about this? Well, it turns out that the marrow space has lots of targets which we can image. There are PET targets, there are MRI targets, but you have to remember that there are, even amongst PET targets, there is crossover. So for example, <coughs> If you were to use, say, uh, FDG PET, FDG PET would look at tumor, would look at macrophages, and would look at osteoblasts. So even something like FDG PET is looking at three activity of three cells in the bone marrow space. And what you guys are looking at at the moment, osteoblasts and bone scans, well, you're just looking at lining cells. You're not looking at tumor cells, which is why it, the biomarker doesn't work very well. So if you look at the PET traces, there are five um, compounds that are clinically approved for use worldwide. So FDG PET is approved. Nobody uses it because it's non-specific. Sodium fluoride PET, really hot in America. Lots of people using it, but it's just a super bone scan. Choline PET, so carbon in the States, fluorine in Europe, approved, 2012, an amino acid metabolite, approved in the US this year, not approved in Europe, and PSMA approved in Europe, uh, the Far East, Australia, but not approved uh, in, in a big number in, in the USA. So this is a super bone scan. So this is sodium fluoride PET, same patient. Now, what you find is the sensitivity increases relative to bone scans. So, but the mechanism is still the same. The CT component of the PET CT improves specificity. Okay, but you have to realize that you are not looking at tumor cells. You are looking at osteoblastic action. And here's an example of that. So here the, in the red arrow, is a lytic deposit, and you can see the activity is at the bone margin. It's not actually in the tumor. In here, see, so there's nothing, there's no activity actually in the middle because you are looking at osteoblasts, not the tumor cells. So it's indirect. Choline PET, often used in, the, in, 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 um, in Europe, and this is looking at something called the Kennedy pathway. 
So the Kennedy pathway looks at the incorporation of choline into membranes. And the important thing for you to remember is that there are some, there's quite high uptake in a number of tissues. So the liver, the kidneys, and the pancreas. So if you look at this patient, you can see there's relatively high uptake here in the liver, salivary glands, pancreas. Now, luckily, there's not many pancreatic metastases that we have to worry about with prostate cancer, but there are liver metastases, and the prevalence of metastatic liver disease increases over time, and anti-mortem is present in 50% of patients. So you start using these, um, these agents in the castrate resistance state, particularly after, on second line, third line. The prevalence of metastatic liver disease goes up, you don't see it because of this problem, okay? The nice thing is that you can look at bone and liver disease at the same time, okay? There are problems. So for example, here is a metastasis, not seen. Here's the higher uptake in the liver. Here, this is not a metastasis, this is a bowel polyp. Here's a metastasis, not seen. Here's a metastasis, not seen, but this metastasis is seen. So the sclerotic deposit is the one that you will miss. And of course, prostate metastases are sclerotic. And that's one of the reasons why you've got a poor performance. So when you have a PSA, your biochemical recurrence is less than one, then you know the tumor is there, but choline isn't showing it to you. So there is this dependence but when you have a PSA of more than five, it's pretty good, okay? So there is this dependence on PSA. And there are multiple small studies, mostly more than 50, 60 patients, showing that you can use choline to monitor response. So here's a patient who gets better, and the arrows show you tumors that get smaller, and then the tumor recurs and the choline increases. So you can use it to monitor response, and it seems to be quite reasonable in small studies so far. The new kid in the block is PSMA PET. You've heard the word PSMA PET several times already in the last, last uh, 24 hours. This is a membrane protein, okay, that is highly expressed, higher in high-grade cancers, and on patients with ADT. So there's upregulation when patients are on ADT. So in other words, you see it better in metastatic disease and in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And this is the mechanism for upregulation of PSMA when patients are on ADT. So there's a good rationale for why you should be using PSMA uh, in the metastatic setting. The important thing is this is not only a imaging, diagnostic imaging target, but it's now also a radiotherapeutic target. Now, part of its advantage over choline is the fact that the liver uptake is less and the background bone marrow uptake is less. So this is the same patient. You can see there's some time has elapsed between the two. Here you can see the choline has uptake in the bone marrow and no uptake here in the lower pelvis because there's been radiotherapy. And you can see there's less activity in the liver, certainly less activity in the pancreas. So here's the pancreatic activity, no pancreatic activity. But you've got bowel activity, you've got kidney activity. Okay, it's better, it's better than choline. So here's a patient with a choline PET, it's negative with a rising PSA following biochemical recurrence and cyberknife radiotherapy. And you can see here's the PSMA PET, there it is. So there's a recurrence at the, at the site of treated disease. Um, this, there was a node there we had treated with cyberknife, and then this is a recurrence in exactly the same area, but no other activity. So just to sh compare uh, choline PET with PSMA. Now, the interesting thing is it has a much better sensitivity profile, but there is still dependence on the PSA level, and this is shown by this meta-analysis. So you can see this is the level one here. Can you see that? That's a PSA of one in, in the biochemical recurrent setting. And you can see almost 60% of patients will have a positive PET on PSMA. But the dependence you can see is there um, at higher levels. So if you have a very high PSA levels, then choline and PSMA are probably as good as each other, particularly if you, once you go for 
a level of about three or four or five. But if you want to look for recurrence at about one and two, then your PSMA PET is going to be better. Okay, so the superiority of PSMA is not there at very high levels of PSA. Okay, but <coughs> realize this. There are patients who will, and there are patients and there are lesions that will only be seen by one modality and not with the other modality, and that will happen. Okay, so it's just something to, to realize. Now, MRI is also the new kid on the block, and MRI can look at the whole body in a detection protocol, is there cancer recurrence in about 30 minutes. If you want to do response assessment, it's about 45 minutes, okay? And so the table time that we give is an hour. But you can do a detection protocol, and I've just written the figures up at the top. Now, you'll, some of you will say, 57 seconds, is that a typo? No, that's not a typo. You can do a whole body T1 in the coronal plane in, 45, in, in 57 seconds <coughs> and this, with a slice thickness of two millimeters. So you can slice the whole body really, really quickly. Now, what's the performance compared to a bone scan, which is what you're using? Well, you know, bone scans, and I, you can see I've deliberately labeled it as BS scans. You see, this is MRI scan performance. This is PET scan performance. But bone scan performance is not as good at, in, the, in, in, in this century. So we need to think about it. Now, in terms of we have criteria for progression. So if things look bad, they're usually getting bad. And here's an example of somebody who looks bad. PSA looks great. Problem, PSA looks good, MRI looks bad, right? So PSA, what you guys are using, be careful, okay? Um, and you can also see other things such as adrenal hyperplasia. So this patient's on enzalutamide and you can see the development of adrenal hyperplasia. So this is before ENZA, this is after ENZA. It's rare, but you do see it. And you can see the emergence of new lesions in the body, okay? And then we have criteria for when things get better. So the problem with prostate cancer is if you treat it effectively, it leaves scars. And when it leaves scars, you don't know what the hell is going on. Okay. So this is one of the problems. The diffusion technique, in fact, helps us here because it doesn't care about scarring. And so you can look at these three-dimensional images, and these, again, are not PET scans. These are MRI scans, and I'll just stop the movie. You can look and say, patient is worse <coughs> between this exam and this exam, starts in docetaxel, you can see the patient improves after four cycles, after 10 cycles, after a break, you can see the disease re-emerges, re then the patient gets treated with the carbacetaxel, and you can see that the, the disease gets better again. Okay, so you can follow treatments over time. Why do you get these changes? You get these changes, and here's another example of changes that you can see on the, on the MRI, because you kill cells. The minute you kill cells, the minute you kill cells, the MRI signal changes. And here's an example of how the MRI changes dramatically. So here is the, what we quantify, the apparent diffusion coefficient before treatment and after four cycles of docetaxel, and then by color coding each one of these voxels in the body, you can see where cell death is occurring. So you can look at a patient like this and say, there's loads of cell kill, there's more kill in the green area. So we've decided to go for three colors because we want to show this to urologists. Red is bad, yellow is dying, green is good. Yes, three colors. So dying, so alive, dying, dead. So yeah, in, in this particular example, red is alive, yes, green is dead, and yellows are dying, okay, just to keep things simple. So, in fact, this technology has now gone into a, a standards document, and it's called METRADS, Metastasis Response Assessment Diagnostic System, and this was published uh, earlier this year in European Urology, and many of you will have seen it. It gives us a method of communicating with you what we are actually seeing. We have criteria for when things go bad, so here's a patient with primary resistance on ADT, and it looks worse, and you wouldn't expect the apparent diffusion coefficient to change. 
and the red should stay red, and you know it does. When disease gets bad, it looks bad, and it stays red for a urologist. More red is bad, okay. Now compare that to, to this patient. So here's, if you were looking, this patient's getting docetaxel. You can see that it's stable. So your radiologist would say stable. The PSA would say the patient is getting better, right? So everybody's happy. Your radiologist is staying stable, correct? The problem is the patient is progressing, right? And here we go. You can see the emergence of new liver disease. This is a problem. Not only do you see the emergence of new disease, but you see lots and lots of red colors, which you can obviously see, but you also see this heterogeneity of response. You can see how red colors are mixing with green colors, are mixing with yellow colors, right? This is this heterogeneity of response uh, coming in. Okay, so why are we going down this route? We're going down this route because currently you are using two criteria, progression, no progression. That's what happens in the clinic every day. That determines what you do and how you act. What we want to do as radiologists is move that on and to give you three response criteria to say something is progressing, something is stable, and something is responding. So you get three groups rather than two groups. And if you get, if we give you a different method of presentation of the data, then perhaps you will start thinking differently. If you start thinking differently, then you might act differently. Thank you very much.